Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're listening, wherever you're tuning in, whether you're watching this on recording or you're watching live with us. Welcome, welcome, hello there. What I want to do is this, first and foremost, uh, thank you so much for coming on board with me today for doing some vocab. Everyone's so excited. Yay, vocab. Yay, longer webinar. What I want to do is this. I want to see in the chat, give me a big old thumbs up if you can hear me loud and clear. Good afternoon, Brittany. Good morning, anybody who is in the morning time. Okay, I'll let you know this. The afternoon is just fine. Wait till you see it. It's amazing. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> and yes, hello to the Stooby Newbies. For everyone who is wondering, is this going to be recorded for your viewing pleasures later on? Yes, absolutely, it's going to be. What I want to make sure is that you do this. You have a couple jobs for me, though, because we're live with the entire Prep Agent family. So if you aren't a member of Prep Agent yet, I'm going to tell you this. Jump on board. Go to prepagent.com. Sign up for membership. You're going to get more webinars like this from myself, our other instructors, Cynthia, Joe, and you're going to get a litany of tests, flashcards, all that kind of stuff to help you pass the exam. So if you're still on that struggle bus to get yourself to pass the exam, then definitely make sure you sign up at prepagent.com. The other thing I'm going to ask you for me, okay, um, is this. I'm going to tell you this. Make sure that you guys smash that like button, hit subscribe, because that's going to help us continue to do things like this in the future so that we let Joe know, okay? We let Joe know. We let the rest of the Prep Agent family know, hey, we like these things. We're, this is stuff that we want to be doing more of in the future. So please make sure that I'm going to ask you several times throughout this that you hit that like button, you hit subscribe. Also, another thing that I'm going to mention to you, whether you are a Prep Agent member or you are not, and listen, I hope that you become one, what I'll tell you is this. You click on over here. If you go to private tutoring, guess what? You can schedule a private tutoring session with myself, with Cynthia. We can help you pass your exam. We've helped a lot of people out there in the prep agent family. So like I said, keep in mind, even if you are not a member, you do not need a member to sign up for private tutoring. So you could do so with either myself or Cynthia. We'd be more than happy to help you. And also keep this in mind if you do want to make private tutoring a part of your study what I need you to do is sign up early and remember, smash that like button, hit subscribe. So let's get the show on the road, okay? One post-it note to rule them all. <laughs> That's what we're going to be working with today. One post-it note. We're going to be going through some vocab. I'm going to hit you with a bunch of different things. So what I want to do is this. Guys, if you are live with me, remember, you can participate. You can ask questions. I encourage it, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to do a mishmash of different things. So I'm going to kind of go through a lot of different stuff. So I'm going to do it off the cuff, and we're going to keep on rocking, keep on rolling. So I'm going to put something up there, and what I want you to do is tell me what it is. So radon. What is radon? What is radon? It's not a good thing, okay? We don't hope to have radon in our homes, right? Make me up, CJ. Your eight-year-old son is listening with you. Well, hello to him. Uh, what's his name? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give him a shout out. So radon is this. Radon is a uh, is a toxic gas. Yeah, it's odorless. It's colorless. And what happens is it's naturally occurring in the um, in the ground. Okay, so it's a naturally occurring radioactive gas. And people always ask me. They say, Stu. What is the situation? Um, uh, so make me up, CJ, said Emmett. Emmett, hey, how you doing? <laughs> uh, I love whenever you guys have your friends uh, friends or family listening to you guys, uh, listening along with you, because I know this is a family affair, so that's why, like I said, I try to keep it nice and um, PG, and also uh, make sure that you guys realize that uh, I love that you, know, you welcome us into your home. So that's not lost on us here at Prep Agent. So I just wanted to say that. So Emmett. Thanks for watching. <laughs> so, you ready? So, yeah, radon is a naturally occurring radioactive gas, okay? And that occurs down in the uh, bedrock, okay? And what happens is this. People have asked me, some of my students said this. Um, the Why aren't we getting sick from radon if it's naturally occurring? Well, think of it this way. Radon only is going to be um, an issue or a concern when it's in higher concentrations. It's in higher concentrations in the home, okay? Because think about this, a hot air balloon. Think about a hot air balloon for a second, okay? If I had a blowtorch and I turned on a blowtorch, 
the hot air would just kind of dissipate into the atmosphere. There wouldn't be anything to really catch it. There wouldn't be anything going on. But if I put a nylon balloon over it, okay, what you do is you turn on the blowtorch, okay? You turn on the blowtorch, and then all that hot air is captured in the hot air balloon, and then the hot air balloon rises. Same thing with radon. Radon, when it's just naturally occurring out in the uh, out in the atmosphere, it's not really harmful, okay, because it just dissipates. It's not going to be higher concentration, okay? And what happens is this. It's not going to really have any health effect on you until you put a home on top of the ground and you kind of capture it like a hot air balloon. So that is what radon is um, you know, what radon is in regards to our radioactive environmental hazards. So guys, what is a mill? Okay. What is a mill? <laughs> Doing a little math here, just like a little bit. Okay. So let's see, what is a mill? You guys always ask about this. You always ask me about this in the math things and listen to what this is. This is one over 1000. This is so millage is this. Millage is going to be a situation where, okay, um, you're going to run into a situation where this will be used for tax rates, okay? So this is used for tax rates when you're going to be calculating it. So um, basically what they would say is they would say the tax rate is four mils. So it will be four over a thousand. So if you're doing that kind of math, it's four divided by 1,000. Okay, um, so Envy said, thank you, Stu. Please send positive prayers. I take my exam tomorrow. I'm not only going to send positive prayers to you, to anyone out there who's taking the exam. Um, we're here for you guys. So like I said, what I want you to do for me is, like I said, hit that like button, hit subscribe if you haven't already. So mil is one over 1,000. So let me ask you this. Who's a mortgagor? Okay. And here's what I'm going to tell you guys. I'm going to be going at a nice clip so we get a lot of words and more words the better. I hope to get through the whole glossary. So give me a thumbs up for that. So who is a mortgagor? So you're right. The OR gives 1,000%. So the person who gives the mortgage, okay? The person who gives the mortgage. So... Let me ask you this question. Who gives the mortgage? Who gives the mortgage? A bunch of you guys are saying a bunch of different things. You ready? The OR gives the mortgage. And I'm going to write a couple things in here. The one who gives the mortgage, this is the borrower. Okay? The borrower. So I think that the next thing that we have to do is this. We have to define... <laughs> we have to define what a mortgage is, okay? So for those of you who are confused, who are trying to figure out, hey, wait, wait, wait a second, you're saying the bank doesn't give the mortgage? Because here's the thing, we always talk about, we kind of use slang, okay? We use slang for a little bit where we say, you know, to a buyer or someone who's interested in getting real estate, we say to them, you're going to get a mortgage. Mm, it's, like, it's like making the bed, okay? It's like making the bed. What I'll tell you is this: um, you you don't make a bed, right? You kind of put it to, put it together. You, uh, you you do something like that. So listen to what I'm going to tell you: the mortgagor is the borrower. The mortgagor, okay, uh, the mortgagor is giving the mortgage to the bank. The mortgage is the pledge of real property, okay, is the pledge of real property for repayment of the loan. So Michelle said she's new to the Stu Crew from Tennessee. Yeehaw, love me some Tennessee. One of my favorite states in the union. Absolutely. So guess what? Uh, big shout out to Michelle and uh, to Tennessee, anybody watching there. So uh, yeah, fantastic. Thank you for joining us. And like I said, you know, hit that like, hit that subscribe. So one thing I'm going to tell you, the mortgage is not the money. It's not the money. Okay. Remember that. Say it with me. I need you to understand that. I need you to type it in there, okay? Everyone who's who's with me, say the mortgage is not the money. So when we say the borrower is going to get a mortgage, nay, nay, they're really not. They're, go they're going to get a loan and then give a mortgage, which is pledging the real property as collateral for repayment of the loan, okay? Um, is collateral for repayment of the loan. So basically, it would be like this. It would be like, um, Michelle, so you're from uh, Tennessee, so that's a good music state, okay? Let's say this. Let's say you lent me 
$500, Michelle. So Michelle gives Stu $500, and then I say to her, I say, Michelle, if I don't pay you back, you can come and take my guitar. You could take one of my guitars as repayment for the loan. That's what a mortgage is. The mortgage is that written document that says, Michelle, you could come take my guitar. Michelle, you could come take that. So you're saying, bank, you could come take my home, okay? You could come take my home, okay, if the um, if I don't repay that loan, okay? So the mortgage is not the money. Look at the Stu crew getting all smart, okay? Um, so let's take a look at this. I'm just taking a look at something like uh, there's a question that came in. Uh, they were operating a mechanic in the area. What type of testing should be done? Um so I'm not really sure. I'd have to, t Teresa, I'd have to take a look at the uh, questions, uh, the, the answers on that one, because I have to see there's something I'm missing in that question to make me understand it. So I'm going to keep moving and grooving. But if you have a question, okay, um, please, please, please feel free to type it in there. So what is amortization? Okay. What is amortization? What does that mean? So... Kat said, love your enthusiasm. Well, I love your company that you're giving me on this beautiful Monday morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're listening. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I try to give you some energy because this stuff is boring as all get out. So if you don't have, uh, if you do not have, uh, you know, good enthusiasm with this, I think that it's really hard to get through this. It's a sludge, especially if we're going to spend some time together today, right? So amortization is to pay off. Like so, what happens is the root word, the Latin in this, okay? Because I like also telling you a little bit about the root words, especially when we're doing vocab. Mort or morte is basically this, okay? Is basically um, to kill, right? So basically, amortization means basically to kill off, to pay off. So what happens is this, okay? You can, in some manner, shape, or form, okay? either partially pay off or you could fully pay off, okay? You could partially pay off or you could fully pay off the loan. So someone asked me to repeat the mortgagor, okay? And this is what mortgagor is. The mortgagor is the one who's giving the, uh, who is giving the loan, okay? The one who is giving the loan. And in regards to um, the uh, amortization, that is to pay off. So you're either going to have, and here's what I want you to do. We're going to actually kind of go through this one. You ready? Let's talk about fully amortized. Okay. Okay. And then also partially amortized. Okay. So while I take a sip of water, what I want you to do is this. Tell me about partial amortization and fully amortized. Okay. Okay, so that is the situation there. So let's take a look at what we have, okay? So situation is this. A fully amortized loan, okay? A fully amortized loan is going to be one that is fully paid off at the end of the schedule, okay? At the end of the schedule, okay? So it is fully paid off at the end of the term. Partially means that there's going to be something at the end, okay? So partially means that there's something that's going to be paid off at the end. So what does partial amortization mean, okay? What does partial amortization mean? Partially amortized means that there's going to be a balloon payment at the end. Boom, balloon payment, okay? So balloon payment at the end, absolutely. So that is the situation there. Perfect, 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 wonderful, okay? So Brittany asked a question, is that the same as a balloon loan? So a balloon loan would be something, here's what I'm gonna tell you, give yourself a gold star because that's absolutely a great question. So a loan that would be considered a balloon loan, okay, is going to have a balloon payment at the end, okay? So situation is this. Partial amortization is going to be one that has a balloon payment at the end, okay? 
And what I will tell you is a balloon loan is going to also be a partially amortized loan. Make sense, guys? Give yourself a gold star. So everyone's doing fantastic in the chat. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Like I said, ask any questions that you would like because I'd be more than happy to try to answer it for you. So let me ask you this. What does it mean to devise something? Okay. What does it mean to devise something? Look at you guys giving yourself gold stars. I love it. So what does devise mean? So Nikki asked me a question while you guys are typing that in. Says if a broker is a sole proprietary, he has one listing which you have, he dies. What happens to the listing? So what I'll do is this. I'll tell you this. Whenever the death of the broker, so death of the broker who's the agent, okay, or the principal would terminate a listing. I mean, it's that, it's that simple. No matter what kind of things you have in there, the death of a broker or a principal will cancel the listing. So thank you for the question. Um, hope that cleared it up. And what I'm going to say is this. So devise, you ready, is to will real property. Boom. So to devise is to will real property. So let me talk about... Um, so, Nikki, if you're asking even hospitalization, hospitaliz hospitalization is not death. Okay, so death of the broker or the um, or the principal would would uh, would be a situation there. Okay, so Eric, did you get done shoveling the snow? I saw him post in Facebook. He said he's going to make it to this wonderful, fantastic webinar. So the divisor, whew, let's talk about that then. You know what? Because I like you guys, and because you had a lot, it looks like you had to shovel a lot of snow. Let's talk about your definition there. So we said. To devise something means to will real property. So what is a devisor? Q Reed said, I'm new here. Thank you for all that you do. Well, if you're new here, make sure you sign up for membership if you haven't already because we have more webinars, more videos in the members section. Okay, we do a bunch every week. Myself, Cynthia, Joe, we're always here chatting with you guys, helping you guys out. <laughs> Listen to me, I can't even talk. Helping you guys out, okay? So... Here's what I'm going to say. You ready? Divisor is the person who gives, okay, who gives real property via will, okay? So let's talk about this one. So here's another one that we're going to say. So the person, so someone said the person who creates the will, it's not the person. So here's the thing. This is what I'll tell you. It's not the one who creates it because you could have an attorney create a will for you. It's the one who is giving the real property via will. So if you die testate, okay, and what does that mean? So you die testate. And here's the thing. I like stringing a couple different words up here also so that you can kind of fast forward and rewind through this uh, webinar and you can see what's on the screen and see what we're talking about. So when you die testate, that, that means, okay, that means that you die with a will. So someone who dies with a will okay, is going to be the divisor for real property, okay? So that's the situation there. And the person who asked that, MT, said, thanks for the clarifications, Stu. Not a problem. That's why, like I said, I tell you guys all the time, join me live if you can because I love interacting with you guys. I like having this make sense. And that's the beautiful benefit of this, okay? So let's keep it moving. Let's keep it grooving, guys, okay? Because we want to get as many words in as humanly possible. So what is constructive notice? What is constructive notice, okay? And someone said intestate is with no will. Yep. 100%. Um, so, Bessie, I guess, guess what? Your, your, your definition, your word is going to be coming up next. I promise you. I'll do, a, I'll do that one. So that one's on deck. That's actually a great one. Okay? So constructive notice. So just to clarify, make sure that I wasn't going too fast for anyone. Okay? Testate is with a will. Intestate is without a will. Okay? I always think intestate incapable of doing anything testate okay um is going to be with a will so constructive notice constructive notice so someone said um putting info out there okay 
putting info out there. So constructive notice is this. Uh, I like Aaron's definition the best, probably telling the world, okay? Um, the, the situation is this, telling the world. Let, let me kind of clarify that. You ready? If I told you guys I'm wearing a gray shirt, guess what? Whether you want this information or not, Okay, whether you want this information or not, you now have actual notice that I am wearing a gray shirt right now. Okay, so that is actual notice. Okay, it could be oral, written, okay, delivered to you, however you receive this information. Okay, is going to be that. So now listen to what I'm about to tell you. Constructive notice would be if I went on Twitter and said, I'm wearing a gray shirt today. So let's say there's a, a world. A crazy world a couple years from now, okay, where all of a sudden Stu becomes this amazing fashionista setting the world on fire, okay? And you, you, you basically say, I want to know where it all started from. Like, where did his fashion trends come in? Where did this, you know, hoodie and pajama, you, you know, little raggedy look come in that, you know, is fashionista Stu? I'm an Instagram model now, okay? So, hashtag Instagram stew, <laughs> what I will tell you is this. You might say, okay, I want to know when this started. So you could look back through my histor history and see what was Stu wearing on February 15th, 2021. You would see that I put out on Twitter that I'm wearing a gray shirt. Me putting that out on Twitter is basically giving the world notice or giving constructive notice to anyone who's interested in it. So when you record something, okay, when you record something like a deed, okay, you guys are saying that, okay, um, when you record a deed, basically what you're doing is you're saying, I have, I have this deed, and what I want to do is this. I want everyone who wants to inspect it to know that I have such a thing, that I have this deed, okay? So that is the situation there. So Ashley also had another one um, in there. So um, Ashley, I'll tell you what, yours is going to, I'm going to put yours on the docket. So uh, that's the situation there. I'm going to, and it, here's the thing. If you guys do have questions, you do have um, words that you want me to define up here in the chat, let me know. Okay, so constructive notice is basically letting the world know, letting them inspect, basically putting it out there in the county records, you know, the equivalent of like, you know, official Twitter, <laughs> you know, basically that's what it is. It's letting people know that they can inspect that. Okay, so this is the situation. So Eric asked, but what is the construction notice, constructive notice in reference to? Typically when you record something. So when you record something in town records, okay. So typically what we're referring to, like the one thing that you would record in a real estate transaction would be a deed, okay? Constructive notice is recording of something so that you could, so that people could come back and take a look at it and see it. You're giving notice to the world, okay? So actual is, um, so someone said actual notice is oral. No, it could be written. I could send you a text message and say, I'm wearing a gray shirt, okay? So that is the situation there. Let's take a look at the next one, a pertinent. And also, too, just keep in mind this. You guys could pause. You could rewind. You have control over this, and this is also going to be on recording. So if there's a section you want to go over again, okay, that is the situation. So what does a pertinent mean? Yeah, you guys are putting it in there. Give yourself a gold star, okay? This is going to be, and it looks like I spelt it wrong. There we go, a pertinent. That means it runs with the land. Now, usually we're talking about this in regards to easements. Easements run with the land, okay? That is the situation there, okay? Um, that is going to be something that we're usually referring to when we say a pertinent, okay? It runs with the the land. So like licenses wouldn't run with the land. License is a temporary right to use something. Okay. But the word appurtenant, if we're just, just looking at that, that means runs with the land. Okay. So yeah, absolutely. Patrice said easements run with the land. Yes. 100% easements run with the land. Licenses are revocable. So give yourself a gold star guys. You guys have been fantastic. Okay. And time flies when you're having a good time. So Let's take a look at the next thing, estate for years. 
And I'm also doing this. I am actually writing down some of your words that you're saying in there. So stick with me because I'm going to definitely try to get to as much stuff as humanly possible. Okay. Um, and I will definitely touch on a bunch of different things. But let's talk about an estate for years. What is that? What is an estate for years? So Heather said that she had to rewind it a little bit, but she's back a little bit. A uh, holographic will intestate or testate. A holographic will is a written one. So an estate for years. Yeah, let me write that in there. It's a defined period of time. Okay. So, yeah, it's it, estate for years is a lease with a defined period of time. Okay. So basically what happens is this. It could be a week. It could be a year. It could be a month. It could be a summer rental. It could be a week-long rental, okay? So when I go down, when me and Mrs. Stu go down to the Isle of Palms in South Carolina, one of our favorite places, we rent a bougie mansion, okay, and usually invite a whole bunch of friends, um, what we do is this. We are renting, um, you know, so, uh, yeah, like a vacation rental. We're renting a mansion for the week. That's an estate for years, okay? It's a defined period of time. So, and, it's, and keep in mind, it's a less than freehold estate. So what is a less than freehold estate, okay? Because we talked about what a uh, freehold estate is, okay? But what is a less than freehold estate? And what I'm going to do is as you guys are typing what a less than freehold estate is in the chat, I'm going to answer just a handful of questions that have been coming in from the live chat. So once again, thank you for joining me on the live chat. Hit that like button. Hit subscribe. Really, really, really important to us because that's going to help us continue to do things like this. Okay. So what I'm going to do is say uh, Amal, and I hope I pronounced that right, said house key is a fixture or real property. So I think we need to define a fixture. A fixture is personal property that has become uh, real property. Okay, um, and so basically you're saying a house key is real property or real property. Um, it's, it, it is real property, actually. It's, um, it's considered to be uh, attached to the, uh, to the door lock by operation. Because the door lock requires the key, even though it is movable, it is legally attached to the door lock. Okay, so that is the situation there. Okay, so less than freehold estate. These are our leases, okay? I always call them leasehold estates. And you have, so let's talk about the difference between this and a freehold estate because I think that that's important differentiation to make. So in the freehold estate, you have the full bundle of rights, okay? And in a less than freehold, you have the right to possess and use. So basically what happens is this. The... Um, the situation is that when you have a less than freehold estate, you have the right to possess a property and use it. So the freehold estate, who's the owner, okay, who's the owner, they have the full bundle of rights, okay? They have the full bundle of rights, okay? What happens is this. When it comes to less than freehold estates, they're going to trans they're basically transferring, parsing out the right to possess and use it. And someone wrote in a math question. I'm gonna stay very far away from math today. Um, I have a ton of math webinars. If you aren't already a prep agent member, sign up for prepagent.com. I have about 20 to 30 math videos on the prep agent member webinar dashboard. So if you go to webinars and prep agent member section, guess what? There is a boatload of math webinars in there. And I go over something different each and every time. Um, so it should be a wealth of knowledge that you should be uh, able to access there. Um, and there's a lot of fantastic things. So definitely check that out if you haven't already. Okay. So... Let's take a look. And you guys keep asking about fixtures. So let's talk about a fixture because you guys are talking about it um, like you are talking about it like there's no one's business in the chat. <laughs> so let's look at this. Okay. So let's take a look at what a fixture is. So tell me what a fixture is. So a fixture is going to be, okay, a fixture is going to be a, um, a a piece of personal property that through 
the legal test of a fixture has now been converted into real property. So when I go out to the store, okay, and I buy a mailbox, okay, and it's sitting in my truck, the mailbox in my truck is personal property, okay? When I cement it down into the ground on my property, it's going to become, okay, real property. So uh, someone asked the big question, is about the freestanding cabinet. Yeah, so there's this question, and I'll, and I'll answer it because this goes kind of like to the conversation about fixtures. There's one that says there's a freestanding cabinet, okay, that is custom built for a um, kitchen, okay. Is this personal property or real property? Okay. So here's the thing. Freestanding cabinet that is custom built for a kitchen. Is this personal property or real property? Okay. So that is going to be the question there. So someone said thank you for answering this one. Not a problem. So this is personal as all get out. Okay. Personal as all get out. Um, the uh, So you could make something that is very, very, very particular to the room, okay? It, it is very much so personal property if it is not affixed to it. So listen to what I'm going to say because I'll tell you a story about me, okay? So I like expensive, nice things, all right? My room is um, my office in my home. It's kind of like my den. It's my personal man cave of sorts, and... What happens is I had a custom-built poker table to match the room to go with it. So the poker table, listen, listen, listen. <laughs> the poker table is very expensive. The poker table is coming with me, okay? The poker table is coming with me, okay? Because it's not attached to the property, okay? If something is freestanding, okay, if something is freestanding, it is going to be considered personal property, OK, so I always use the example if you take the property and you flip it upside down, OK, if it moves, if it shakes, if it shake and bakes, OK, it's more than likely going to be personal property. OK, so someone said, what about a hot tub? Um, if it's a, I would say a hot tub, I would have a, see, they wouldn't give you a question like that on the test as far as a hot tub is concerned, in my opinion. Um, but if it's attached, um, to the property in some manner, shape or form, then I would say it stays. Okay. That's, that's why the, the M in, cause we have the, uh, legal test of a fixture, right? Maria M A R I A. Okay. Method of attachment is matters. You know, is it nailed, screwed, or glued? Okay. So if it is not attached to the property in any manner, shape, or form, then I would say uh, that is the situation. Okay. Um, so let's talk about, okay, let's talk about trade fixture. Trade fixture. Okay. So what is a trade fixture? And what I'll do is while you guys are typing in trade fixture question uh, answer, I'm going to dive into the chat and answer some more of your questions. Okay. So someone asked about this. What about a pool cover? Okay. Pool cover, I would say, stays with the property because, again, just like a key to a lock is going to stay with the property, that, is, that has a unique relationship to the pool. Okay. If the pool is considered a fixture, if it's built in, cemented in, it's part of the real property, I would say that it has a unique relationship to the pool. So even though it might move, it has a unique relationship to that item. So I would say that it is legally a fixture. Okay. That's my that's the reason I say. And that's and listen, this is what I'm telling you. I'm giving you my opinion on a lot of this stuff. I'm giving you my professional opinion, okay? As far as and I'm answering it to the way that I would answer it on the test. Okay. So Trade fixture. This is a little different than a fixture, right? A trade fixture is going to be one in which... Let's talk about this. Trade fixture. So someone asked what Maria stands for. Maria is method of attachment, adaptation to the real estate, relationship to the parties attaching it, intentions of the parties attaching it, and agreement 
between the parties. What I might do is on the next slide after we answer trade fixture, I will go through, I'll type that out for you guys so that you understand, okay? I'll type that out for you so that you have it, okay? Because I know that a lot of people are asking fixture questions. I know that those are some confusing questions on the test. So what is a trade fixture, okay? Trade fixture is something like a pizza oven, a dentist chair, okay? Um, so um, a, a trade fixture um, is going to be the salon basins, the salon sinks, stuff like that. It's basically used in, it's basically used in the business. And what it's going to be considered personal property of the business, okay? It's going to be personal property of the business. So whenever we're talking about a trade fixture, we're going to be talking about it goes with the business. It does not go with the real estate. Make sense? Okay. So how about a fan which is attached to the wall? That's a fixture, in my opinion. If you have a fan attached to the wall, like a ceiling fan, that's a fixture, in my opinion. So that's what I would say. So let's keep going. Let's talk about this. So I told you the legal test of a fixture or Maria, okay, right? And I'm going to type them out now. You have method of attachment, adaptation to the real estate, relationship of the item to the parties, intention of the parties attaching it, okay, and agreement. So here's the thing. The reason why agreement is last, okay, the reason why agreement is last is because over oh, listen listen even though it might not walk talk so let's say that freestanding cabinet that was custom built for the kitchen even though even though the um the, the, the it might not fit all the things as far as it's not attached to the property if the buyer and the seller agree okay yeah that's part of the real property they can include that like they could make it a fixture through a you know mentioning it in the contract. So that's totally something that could be done. Make sense? So that's the situation there. So let's take a look at next question. So I promise you I'd put that up there for you guys, okay? Let's take a look at the next one. What about hmm Oh, I know what I want to talk about. Let's see. Because I have like a whole bunch of words here. Blockbusting. Okay. Blockbusting. What is blockbusting? What is blockbusting? And here's the thing. I'm going to try to get to as many words as you guys want to today. Because we have time. Okay. We have time. So I want to get to, like I said, as much stuff as I possibly can. So I'm going to try to get to the stuff that you guys want to hit. So that's why I say... Good that you're here with me live. So, what is blockbusting? So, I see a bunch of you typing in panic selling. Okay, so what is panic selling? What is that? What is that? What is that? Mm -hmm -hmm. So, I see that's when you down talk property. Well, no, that's not down talking a property. Um, so, what it is is this. It's going to be when you... Tell someone, hey, you should sell now. Those people are moving in or those people are moving out. So it's basically a protected class. You're saying, hey, guys, th th these people are moving in or these people are moving out. Um, you got to you, you, you must, 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 must sell now. OK, you must sell now. OK, so telling a seller, hey, you have to sell now because you're going to lose money on your property if you do not sell now. So. Let's do this. So that has to blockbusting has to do with selling. Okay. Now let's talk about the one, the evil kissing cousin to it. Steering. What is steering? Okay. So someone asked difference between block busting versus panic selling. Nope, they're the same thing. Okay. So someone said, is blockbusting illegal? Yes, 100%. It is illegal, okay? So blockbusting and panic selling, or they also refer to as panic peddling, okay? Um, that would be something that uh, is going to be illegal. So all those things are illegal, okay? Yeah, Tiffany said blockbusting is illegal, 100%. So steering. Steering. So steering is channeling a buyer to or away from an area, okay? To or away from an area. So basically what happens is this. 
if you push certain people because they belong to a certain protected class, like you take, you know, one family to this area because it matches their religion or their perceived religion, you know, okay, that could be that could be considered steering. Okay. Now, let me go through another one. So someone asked in the chat. Would um, that have to do with the chemical plant that is opening up down the street? Like if I said, hey, the chemical plant is moving in, the chemical plant is not a protected class, okay? So if a chemical plant or there was some sort of economic, um, there was some sort of issue outside of the property lines, that I was like, hey, uh, guys, listen, um, do you know this? The, the landfill is being put in here. Yeah, I mean, I use that all the time. Like, if there's an economic situation that would impact the property negatively, like a landfill or a chemical plant or something like that, yeah, 1,000%, I, I put that in there. I make sure that I tell people all the time, hey, look, maybe you want to sell now because the chemical plant is not going to be something that is going to be um, protected. It's not a protected class, okay? Um, but it has to do with, has to do with steering and blockbusting has to do with, um, the situation with, uh, fair housing and the protected classes. Okay. Uh, make me up. CJ said, what about a casino? Yeah. Same thing. I mean, if you think that there's going to have some, some sort of negative or positive impact, you know, and sometimes it could be both. It could be, Hey, sell now. You know, because uh, the casino is moving in and we're going to prices are skyrocketing now. You know, depends. It depends. That's fine. If there's any kind of situation outside of the property line um, situation is that um, they're not protected classes. OK, so that is the answer there. So let's talk about general agency, general agency. What is general agency? OK. Are corporations a protected class because they're individual? No, no, no. Corporations are not a protected class. Companies, McDonald's is not a protected class. <laughs> no, no. Amazon, no. Tesla, no. Okay. Uh, general agency. That's when someone works um, works for somebody, okay, on behalf of somebody, and they work in a universal capacity within one business aspect. And let me... Let me explain this, okay? So they have universality within one business aspect. So let, let's let's give an example, okay? So Joe owns four properties, okay? Joe owns four properties. Each one is an apartment building. Property A is managed by Cynthia. So Cynthia manages property A. That is managed by her. Over here, property B is managed by your good old friend, Stu, <laughs> okay? So what happens is this. Cynthia gets to work on behalf of Joe, okay? Gets to work on behalf of Joe at property A. She has universality within that. What do, what do I mean by universality? That means she could call a plumber up to fix a plumbing issue. If there's a roof issue, she could call a roofer, okay? If she wants to go and advertise for a vacancy in there, okay, then what happens is she could go and advertise for a vacancy. But if something happens at Stu's property, you know, let's say Stu's out having way too much fun, okay? I'm having way too much fun. And I'm, I'm out at the beach or I'm out, you know, parasailing, okay? And my property's being neglected. Could Cynthia come in and pick up the slack and do what I'm not doing? No. She is only kept to property A. I am only kept to property B, okay? That is a general agency, okay? That is a general agency. And you guys are doing a fantastic job giving me actually extra words to go over. So I appreciate that. Thank you, okay? And um, you guys said, hey, could we go over, could we go over a special agent? Absolutely. So most of the times this is going to be real estate agents, okay? Okay. That's going to be real estate agents. And they basically have one task, you know, one job. Okay. One thing that they're employed to. Okay. So that is the situation there. So real estate agents are really the best example. Okay. The best example of a special agent. Does that make sense? 
it's really it just has one particular task. So here's the thing: if I'm listing a property, let's say I list the property for Joe. Okay, let's say I list the property for Joe. Then here's what happens. Okay, um, what happens is this. If I list a property for Joe, then the bottom line is, okay, bottom line is this. I do not have the authority to fix the uh to to, to fix the the roof if the roof is leaking, okay? I don't have the responsibility to fix the roof if the roof is leaking. Um I'm just basically there to find a buyer for Joe. That's it. I'm there to find a buyer and that's it. Nothing else. Does that make sense? Give me a thumbs up if you're with me, guys, okay? So give me a thumbs up if you're with me. And here's the thing. This is what I'm going to tell you. Although we have two hours today, okay? So someone said, not according to my books, Stu. Okay. Well, your book might be wrong. <laughs> my, my definition I just gave you was good. Um, I will tell you this, just so you know. And I, listen, I don't trash on the books that much. But there are some books out there that have errors in them, all stuff like that. Um, bottom line is this. Um, there's the stuff that I usually get you, uh, you know, as far as information, I try to carefully curate it. And look, look, this is what I'm going to tell you. Okay. Um, what happens is this. Someone said, can this be all day? No, Joe cannot afford me all day. Go 24 hour marathons do. Maybe I'll do that. Okay. Um, so what happens is this. Um, so, yeah, so real estate, so special agents or real estate salespeople or general, yeah, no, that wouldn't be. Um, uh, what happens is this: it depends on how they're. It doesn't see. What I'll tell you is this in regards to that that explanation. What I'll say is, bottom line, you 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 have to give the scenario because, like, if I'm giving the scenario of the situation where you have. Um, you know, where you have one particular task or one particular job. And here's the thing. You have to always understand um, the special agency, okay, special agency is going to be the agency relationship is going to be this. You always have, you ready? You always have the relationship between the broker and the client, okay? You always have the relationship between the broker and the client. So it's always the broker and the client that we're talking about. Not necessarily the salesperson, okay? The salesperson is um, working as a representative of, okay? It's working as a representative of the broker, okay? That's always what it is from here to Timbuktu. So if they break down and say, you know, go into the specifics like that, I'm not really a fan of how they're wording it. I think they're overcomplicated, okay? Um, Ashley said, I don't know how to do the thumbs up. Well, when you say that, I don't know how to do the thumbs up, that's almost the equivalent of a thumbs up. So let's talk about this because some of you did this. Uh, market value. Uh, Nancy said, love you guys. Great team. Remember, hit that like button then. Okay. We want to know how much you like us. Okay. Because this is something new we're doing where I'm going longer. Okay. Um, where I'm going longer for you guys. So it's basically, you know, I always say there's never, there's never enough stew crew, right? There's never enough stew crew in a webinar. <laughs> So, yeah, there's a couple of th people that are putting in, um, putting in great information. Okay, here's the situation with market value. That is what a property should sell for. Okay, so if we have a ready, willing, and able buyer, we have a ready, willing, and able seller. Okay, um, and what happens is this: this is the value that it should sell for based on analysis. Okay, um, that is the situation there. That is market value. Okay, so. Let's change it up a little bit. Let's do market price because you guys always ask that question too. That's like a popular one. Market price. What is market price? What is market price? So we said market value is what it should sell for. So market price is actually what it does sell for. Okay? So awesome, 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 amazing stuff. So value is what it should sell for. Price is what it does sell for. So let's go to this. Let's go to functional obsolescence. Functional obsolescence. Okay. What is that? What is that? Someone said, oh, snap, I had them backwards. Yeah, that happens. And listen, I'll tell you this. I mean, I've been doing this for 14 years. Um, 
I, and I will tell you this: there were points in my in my instruction career where I, I totally was teaching some kids. I let listen. I probably let like several real estate agents go out into the wild early on in my career. And my gosh, I don't know how they made it through. I sent them out there with, but basically, my my when my real estate instruction career started. Um, you, you ever see the, uh, the the coming attractions or the the movie Bird Box with Sandra Bullock, where they're just blindfolded and just going through life blindfolded? Basically, like my my students fourteen years ago. I mean, God bless them. Some of them are still in the business. Some of them are fantastic. Some of them are wonderful. Um, I totally blindfolded them. I don't know how they got through the test. So you're getting a much more refined version of Stu. I don't have a lot of hair left, but you're getting a much more refined version. So let's talk about functional obsolescence. Functional obsolescence is this. You ready? That is when the home is not functioning the way the way that we would have it function, with the way that we should have it function. No, 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 trust me, you're getting the much more refined. Brittany said, please don't do that to me, Stu. No, 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 you're getting 14 years. It took me 14 years to get here. I'm amazing right now. I'm fantastic. Listen, I'm, I'm mwah, chef's kiss. You guys know, when you see all the comments that come in, we're helping people pass. We're private tutoring people. That's exactly what we're doing. We're making sure that you guys have everything that you need to pass the exam. And the information I'm giving you, and the reason I said that, I told you that story, is because, yeah, there are errors in books. There are things that you get out there. And I totally, I'm just telling you that I even screwed things up. I'm human, okay? So functional obsolescence would be a five-bedroom, one-bath. <laughs> five-bedroom, one-bath, okay? Um, that is 1,000% going to be correct. You know, like a five-bedroom, one-bath. Or if you have a closed-off... Um, you know, a closed off uh, floor plan, like you wouldn't build it that way. Okay. Um, that is going to be a situation where you're going to have um, what the home is going to experience functional obsolescence. Now, let's say, I, let's say this. You ready? Um, there a couple, you wrote a couple things down. Functional obsolescence. I want to ask you this. If I say we have an outdated heating system, if I said we have an outdating heating system, okay, yeah, those poor students 14 years ago, <laughs> there was much more, listen, it was much more palatable, I was much, uh, I was, uh, I was much um, more palatable to the eyes, being all, all svelte and, 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 you know, beautiful head of hair, you know, now you're just getting the wisdom, that's why I sit behind the microphone now, and I don't, I don't go on live camera that much, <laughs> so, an outdated heating system, what would you say that is? Functional obsolescence, physical deterioration, something like that. So, what I will tell you is this. An outdated heating system, okay, is going to be... Some people are tossing it up between physical and functional. Listen, you ready? Outdated doesn't mean falling apart. Physical deterioration, physical deterioration is going to be... It's crumbling, falling apart. An outdated anything is going to be um, is going to be functional. If it's outdated, it's not necessarily broken. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for so Mary, and I always get Mary or Marie mixed up. I always forget the I and the Y. I, I, I don't, I'm bad at that. So I hope I pronounce it correctly. Um, you put it right. You hit the nail right in the head. Functional because it's not broken. Okay. If we said that this, um, this, the, this. Uh, this system, okay, um, th that the outdated heating system is not falling apart, then it's just functional, okay? It's just functional, okay? So that is the situation there. So heating system, because here's the thing. I might have put in an old outdated heating system, but it might be brand new, okay? So let's take a look at the next question. So let's do exclusive agency listing, Okay. Okay, exclusive agency listing, okay? Sure, outdated things might be able to be upgraded when you buy it, right? Sure, okay. So, what is an exclusive agency listing? Tell me, guys. Type it in the chat. I'd love to see what you guys think. So, let's take a look. So, exclusive agency listing, okay? Abram said, uh, physical is like the roof coming apart. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Like, basically, there's something physically wrong with it, okay? Like, my deck in my backyard, let me give you an example. The deck in my backyard, okay, is beautiful. 
The layout's perfect. Um, I live very close to the water, so basically it rots out. Like I'm getting a new, um, I'm, I'm getting a new Trex deck this year um, because the wood just rots out like every five years. So it's physically deteriorating. Functionally, it's not obsolete. Like I'm literally going to replace it with the same fo footprints. Okay, so there's a perfect example. So. An exclusive agency listing means that there's one broker, okay? They ain't cheating. There's one broker, okay? Okay? Ain't cheating. But seller has the right to sell on their own without paying a commission, okay? Without paying a commission. And, yeah, I do type that fast. Wow. <laughs> so one broker, but seller has the right to sell on their own without paying a commission. So basically what happens is this. The only way, the only way that you would get a commission is if you were the procuring cause. Okay? So let's do this. We're going to do this. Procuring cause. Okay? So, and I hope you like this because what happens is we go over a lot of different uh, topics. So, again, I'm going to ask you guys because we're almost like halfway through this. What I want you to do is smash that like button, hit subscribe, and what I want you guys to know is this, okay? I want you to know that if you are looking into private tutoring session, we offer private tutoring. So, guys, you could sign up for a private tutoring session with myself, Cynthia. Just go over to prepagent.com. Click up in the upper right-hand corner. You could schedule a session with us. Um, and here's what I'll tell you. Schedule sooner rather than later because we do book up very quickly. Okay? So that's super important. So procuring cause. Okay? So some of you guys are saying they brought the buyer. Not necessarily, okay? Um, what happens is this. Procuring cause is going to be, I'm going to give you the textbook definition, okay? Textbook definition is this, okay? Procuring cause is the person who brought about, okay, um, who brought about an unbroken chain of events that led to a meeting of the minds, okay? The person who brought about an unbroken chain of events that led to a meeting of the minds. Someone asked how long are these sessions? They're all day. No. <laughs> you guys ask if I could go all day. I can't. I would have no voice at the end of that, okay? You don't want that. Um, these about we have, We're about halfway through. So um, if you've been with me, okay, um, if you've been with me for this long, we got about basically double what we just did. We're going to go through more, okay? So that is the situation there. So procuring cause is going to be someone who brought about an unbroken chain of events that led to a meeting of the minds. Now, okay, so let's take a look at the next question. You ready? I'm going to get through. I, I see a bunch of, listen, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to get through a couple of the ones that you're hitting in the chat. I see a bunch of you guys repeating stuff. I'm going to get to you. Don't worry. You'll be happy. So, exclusive right to sell, okay, exclusive right to sell. Private tutoring sessions are one hour long, okay, and they're virtual. So you could sign up, and it will tell you everything. You could check my schedule. You could uh, check my schedule right now if you wanted. So procuring causes, basically, it's a person who brought about an unbroken chain of events that led to a meeting of the mind. Your book actually might actually say this. Your book might say that it's sometimes hard to define. So some of you might say that's the one who brought the buyer, and it might not entirely be wrong. Um, but like I said, if we're giving the technical definition, it's the person who brought about an unbroken chain of events. So um, that's – and I'm giving you textbook, okay? So let's look up at this one, okay? Let's look at this one. No matter what, the broker gets paid. Yeah, this is money, money, honey, honey. You do your money dance, okay? Listen, listen. And I'll tell you this. Um, what, what I'm going to tell you right off the bat, if you guys if you guys haven't figured out what your money dance is, you got to figure out what your money dance is. Mine is a little, like, elbows up, like, hands up, and I, I just, just do a little shimmy because I can't get, I can't, I can't move too much because I'm tubby. I'm tubby because I like food. So I just wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Every morning I do my money dance, okay? So maybe you guys need to pass your exam test, and then you could evolve that into a money dance. Just, 
just a little, you know, butt wiggle in the seat, okay? Money dance helps you actually feel motivated in the morning, okay? So exam prep dance and then like a money dance. That's what I do. I, I, every single one of my um, my <laughs> my brokerage meetings, I start um, I, I start with uh, the money dance. <laughs> so um, let's talk about exclusive right to sell. It's in the name. You get paid no matter what. You have the exclusive right to sell, okay? You have the exclusive right to sell it, okay? No matter who brought the buyer, no matter what happens, you are getting paid, okay? So that's when you do the money dance, okay? You get an exclusive right to sell listing, and that's just money in the bank. So, oh, my God. Let's take a look at some other ones. Sub-agency. Because I think one of you guys who's a regular here, um, basically, I, I think, uh, I forget who typed it in. Was it New Dimensions? Typed it in like 15 times. So what's sub-agency? Okay. Okay, someone said, imagine Bruno Mars dancing. That's my style of dancing. Um, I'll tell you this. I, I, I basically have two left feet. Okay. Um, <laughs> I will tell you that. Um, so, um, and Eddie, I'll also explain that as well. I saw your question come in. Okay. So... Let us take a look at this one. An agent of an agent. Yeah, so watch this. Watch this. Ready? I'm going to show you. I'm going to draw it out because I like drawing it out, okay? And I hope you don't mind. Here's a seller. Agent works for them. You're a sub-agent of the seller, okay? So you're technically working for the seller because you're a sub-agent of the agent. It's an agent of an agent, okay? So they work for their fiduciary duties are back to the seller, because they're working for the agent. You're an agent of an agent. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. So um, what I will tell you is this. If you're looking for a way to describe that in practice, that is super particular. Sub-agency is not... It is not entirely practiced in every state that much anymore. So um, what happens is this. That's why if you're looking for an example, there isn't gr a great one. Okay, there isn't a great one typically. And they sometimes refer to um, the situation um, of, uh, let's see, uh, just want to see. Yep, okay, you guys could see this. I thought I was having an issue with my video for a second. That's why I had a little little brain fart that you just heard out loud, okay? Um, so someone said, does a sub-agent have a license? So here's the thing. Again, going into particulars in regards to sub-agency, I will tell you this. It's very hard because as far as examples, okay, as far as examples, I'm not going to get into it because you guys are going into super particulars that you don't need for the test. Like, do you split a commission? Do you this? Do you that? Here's the thing. Agency relationships, okay, agency relationships are very clear cut. You're an agent of an agent, okay? So what happens is this. Don't get it too confused. Do not keep it. Listen, if you're thinking beyond it's an agent of an agent, okay, then what happens is this. You're thinking too much about it, okay? So Brittany said, keep it simple, like a child's book. Joe, listen, I have about, if you didn't know this about me, I'm not the sharpest crayon in the box, okay? If you didn't know this about me, I'm not the sharpest crayon in the box. I know my real estate stuff really well, okay? But I will tell you this. Um, if I didn't keep it simple, <laughs> if I didn't keep it really super simple, I, my head would explode. Okay. So that is the situation there. So let's see. Um, <laughs> Heather said, I'm still behind a few minutes, but this may be out of context, but Stu is a hoot. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, you know what? What I'll tell you is this: I, I try to be a hoot because this stuff. Again, I tell you, sis. Um, I'll tell you this: it's it, it it's very very dry. It's very dry. Okay. Yeah, Joe says keep it simple, keep it concise. Listen, if your definition does not fit on a post-it note, your definition is too long. If you're doing flashcards, okay, and your flashcards are you're writing it in the tiniest pen that you possible possibly could write it in, okay, then what happens is you're writing too much, okay? You're writing way too much, okay? So bottom line is you keep it simple, keep it concise because that's what you're going to war with when you go to the test, okay? When you go to the test, you are going to war 
with whatever's in your head. And if it's too complicated, okay, um, if it's too complicated, then bottom line is this. You're going to have a hard time answering the question, okay? Um, so let's learn a little bit. What is Chattel, okay? And for those of you, if I have any app developers in the crowd, I have always wanted to get a realtor-only community application called Snapchattel. So if anyone wants to take me up on that, take my idea, fly with it, run with it, do whatever you have to, Snapchattel. Let's make it a thing. <laughs> so Chattel is personal property. Yep, so it's movable. My fountain pen collection is going to be considered Chattel, okay? Is going to be considered Chattel. So that is what it is. It's personal property. It's movable. Chattel cattle move. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys know that really well, really well, right? So what is a deed? What is a deed? What is a deed? What is a deed? In simplest terms, okay? Patrice, good luck. Virginia's a tough test. Good luck on, on your test there. Virginia has, that's basically... When I'm moving, when I'm basically traveling and I'm driving in my car and I'm going south, okay, as soon as I hit Virginia, that's where I know that good good barbecue starts. So a deed is a document. Um, uh, let's see. 471 persons watching Stu. We need more. We need more. Share this with your friends and family. Tell them to jump on. We tell some jokes every once in a while. We make it fun. Learning is fun. So this is evidence of transfer of titles. So a deed is evidence of transfer of title. Yeah, so a deed is evidence of transfer of title, okay? So that is how we basically take our ownership interest and we transfer it to another person, okay? So let's do this. Let's go to the next one. Um, so someone said, Mike said, all three of my personalities are here. I don't even know what that fully means. Like, are you signed in on three computers and you're just going like that? Or do you have a split personality and you're like, you know what? You're getting three different versions of me in the chat. I love it. I love it, though. Whichever one it is, whatever the answer is, I'm, I'm all for it. So let's go into, let's answer what is title. Okay, what is title? Oh, man. So what is title? Title is proof of ownership, right? Proof of ownership? Like that? Okay. <laughs> One log on three minds. <laughs> I love it. I love you guys. I really do. And I, that's why, listen, I'm going to tell you this. Um, I, I appreciate you guys coming on with me live. And for those of you who can't, who really wish you were here live? Um, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't hate you for that. I, I totally know that life gets in the way. So I want to tell you if you're watching this on recording, I'm sending a special little bit of love out to you guys. So give yourself a gold star. Say hello to your friends and family. All that kind of stuff. Let's have some fun. So let's talk about this one: ad valorem taxes. Okay, what are those? What are ad valorem taxes? Now we're getting into the Latin, right? So title is ownership. Just think, and here's the thing: keep it simple. Like, do you see how I? Keep it really nice and simple. And you guys, okay, um, you guys, what I need you to know and understand is this. You don't need an example for everything. Sometimes, okay, sometimes <clears throat> you just need a definition and just run with it. Don't overcomplicate it with the complicated uh, example. If I ask you what a definition is and you guys are saying it's like when, mm -mm, you've already said too much. You said you've spoken too much. You've spoken too much, okay? So, ad valorem taxes. And Selena, you have a great question. I'm actually going to probably go to those words next. That's actually a really good one. So, ad valorem are, are general real estate property taxes. So, when my father, when I was younger, I didn't really understand real estate that well when I was a young stew, when I was a young buck. And he would say to me, my property taxes are too darn high. I own a townhome and I don't even do... Basically, he was saying, okay, um, so he was saying this. He was saying... Um, that um, his ad valorem taxes were really high. I just didn't know it at the time, okay? So ad valorem taxes are the, so what this means is according to value, okay? Ad valorem according to value, for those of you who want to know the, uh, the, the information there. So let's talk about tenants in common, okay? Okay, what is tenants in common? <coughs> what is tenants in common? What is that? 
that's a way that you could take title to a property, right? Okay. So tenants in common is a way that you could take title to a property. Okay. So um, let's see. That is okay. Yeah. Okay. So I see that you guys have a bunch of things in here. So this is more than one person. So I'm always going to give you my funny little way that I remember it. Tenants in common, usually common people, okay? So, hey, you guys haven't met me yet, okay? So, Peggy, Mike, if we decided to buy a property together, okay, we'd be common people to one another. Even though you're a member of the Stu Crew, we're common to one another, okay? So, what happens is you would want to make sure that if we found a good investment online today, okay, that if we were to go buy a property, so it's me, Peggy, and Mike, okay, and what we do is this. We would probably buy the property as tenants in common because each one of us would want to devise the property to our heirs, okay? Meaning you can do that. So you can devise the property, can devise, okay? And it allows for unequal shares. So let's say um, let's say that, you know, Peggy and Mike were like this. Um, they said, Stu, we know that you make a ton of money because you come on here, you make us laugh, and we know that Joe has to pay premium buku bucks for that. He has to pay premium buku bucks for the stew. And what I'll tell you is this: um, I, let's say you said to me, Stu, could you could you buy seventy percent of it, and then you know we want to split it fifteen and fifteen percent us. We just want to kind of be in an investment with you. We could do that because we're tenants in common. So tenants in common is usually common people. Okay, so. Selena said, thank you. You said my name right, too. I'm usually horrible with that. So I, pre I appreciate that. That actually put a smile on my face. I said it right. That is awesome. So let's talk about joint tenancy. Okay, joint tenants. Okay. So joint tenants, you need the unity of time, title, interest, and possession, which means that all those need to be unified. Okay, all those need to be unified. Okay. So when you have that, okay, and when you have that, you would have, okay, the right of survivorship, which means, okay, which means that when someone dies, okay, in joint tenancy, okay, when someone dies in joint tenancy, then the other remaining surviving people would get, um, would get their um their interest okay would get their interest so that is the situation there okay that is the situation with that and what i usually say with that remember i said to you i said tenants in common were usually common people to one another we don't really know each other maybe okay joint tenancy i would say these would be people that i would probably share a joint with if i was that kind of person okay so that is the thing i would be like yeah no i want to make sure you get the property so that's how i remember it a little crude way to remember it but i just figured that helps a couple of you i'm gonna get a, i'm gonna get a little laugh from a couple of you okay um someone said this okay um so let's see um let's see what we're saying in the chat okay so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys like that one. Um, so I do not live in Cali, for those of you who uh, who are wondering. So so in joint tenancy, you have the right of survivorship. In tenants in common, you do not, okay? So that is the situation there. So let's keep it moving and grooving. Yeah, keep it as simple as humanly possible when it comes to your definitions of things, okay? So that is really what I always tell you guys, all right? So let's look at the next definition, okay? Ooh, I have a bunch of them right here. I, you guys were putting a, a couple of them in the chat that I wanted to go through. Oh, I know what I wanted to go through. Here we go. You ready? Let's do universal agency. Kind of round out the agency conversation. So Joe's in the chat. Look at that. Look at that. He said, great job, Stu. I get a shout out from the from from, from the head honcho from El Jefe. <laughs> so Joe is on. He usually usually doesn't jump onto a chat. Um, so what is universal agency? What is universal agency? Now is the time since Joe is on to uh, make sure that you hit that like button, you hit subscribe, and also everyone. Put a gold star and say, give Stu a raise. <laughs> so what is uh, universal agency, guys? Okay. So universal agency is going to be the best example of this. Is going to be 
universal agency. Best example is going to be power of attorney. Okay. Now, when here's something I do want to talk about. Power of attorney, okay, is going to be this. Um, power of attorney is going to be the instrument that makes someone that creates, okay, someone uh, creates an attorney in fact. So I have, okay, I have power of attorney for my grandparents, okay? So I am their attorney in fact, okay? To make it clear, okay? To make it clear, I am their attorney in fact, okay? And that was, I am, I was given that by having power of attorney. So universal agency means that you could do anything for them. You could do anything. So if I was Joe's attorney in fact, I could go lease him a new car. So if he wanted to get a Lamborghini, if he wanted to go buy a Lamborghini for Stu, maybe a Porsche for Cynthia, something like that. You know, I mean, we could definitely work something out if I had power of attorney. I could just, you know, sign a couple papers, push a couple things around. Okay. So, um, and also just keep in mind, actually, Joe just put it in the chat. We have our agent school channel. That's where if once you guys pass the exam, so once you graduate, okay, once you have that pomp and circumstance, you're ready to go out into the real estate field we have webinars that are going to help you in your career so we have more Stu, more cynthia more joe so go on over to agent school that's all one word on youtube if you're searching hit that like button hit subscribe and make sure you check out some of the videos there okay so joe's popping that in there so absolutely fantastic now one of you guys put something in there you ready asbestos what is asbestos okay what is asbestos what is asbestos? Joe heard all you guys were having fun, so he had to jump into the chat. So asbestos isn't mold, okay? So think of asbestos as this, okay? Asbestos is an amazing. Let's just let's just put a couple things out there, okay? Um, <laughs> Selena said, I thought Joe and Stu were the same person. We have never actually been seen in the same room together. So, uh, I, verdict's out. <laughs> so here's what asbestos is. It is an amazing, amazing um, e e e e e chemical that actually acts as an amazing insulator, okay? Um, it works as an amazing insulator. So back in the day, back in the yonder years, okay, what they used to do was they put asbestos, they treated asbestos as Frank's Red Hot. For those of you who do not know um, Frank's Red Hot motto, they put that on everything. <laughs> so what asbestos is was basically um, a uh, insulator that works so well that they put it in tiling, they put it in floors, they put it in um, you know uh, roofing. Okay, they put it in uh, the biggest thing that you see it still left in. Okay is it's usually wrapping pipes, okay? And one of the properties of asbestos that makes it, um, it, that makes it really hazardous is that it's friable, okay? It's friable, which means that it's crumbly. It becomes airborne, okay? So what happens is if left undisturbed, okay? If left undisturbed, it's absolutely fine. You don't touch it, okay? It's fine. Nothing's going to happen, Okay? But if you start poking it, okay, what happens is it becomes airborne, ingested into the lungs, very, very hazardous. So I think there is a question on your test, where, on some of your tests, where they ask you about remediation, okay? They ask you about um, the, um, the they, they ask you about how you would remediate it. Um, the best way to remediate it, if it is possible, is encapsulation, okay? is encapsulation, which means that they basically, they don't disturb it, they don't take it out, because remember, that is when it becomes hazardous. So what they do is they basically wrap another layer around it, okay, and they basically um, they, they basically do that. They encapsulate it they, so that no one goes and touches it, okay? So that is the situation there. So let's talk about this. Let's talk about... Does popcorn ceilings have uh, asbestos? Some of them do. Some of them do. Okay. Um, so some of them have asbestos in it. It really depends. Uh, it depends on the situation. Okay. So let's talk about what an FHA loan is. Okay. What is an FHA loan? What is an FHA loan? 
the Fahahlone. <laughs> was what one of my students told me once, and I always, I always think about that. I never, I don't think I've ever told the prep agent family that. Um, that was at least I was almost wheezing when I first heard that. I mean, it was, it was like a seventeen-year-old student, okay, and he goes the Faha loan, <laughs> and I don't know why that just set me off, but now I can't stop thinking about it whenever I say it. So the FHA loan, okay, and this is so what? So what does the FHA do in this? So someone said it's a government loan. So, okay, listen to what I'm going to tell you. You ready? It's not a loan from the government. The government does not, cannot bankroll this stuff, okay? Government can't. So let's, let's just say this. The government cannot purchase mortgages or notes. They cannot lend money. They don't have that kind of money. Okay, they do not have that kind of institutional power or that kind of bankroll. They just don't. They don't have that. So it's very important that you realize and you understand that they're not issuing the loan. They're insuring the bank. So what happens is what they do is it's usually for people who might have a lower down payment or who might be credit challenged. Now, it might not be the two of them at the same time. Okay, might not be the two of them at the same time. So. You might have someone who has very, very good credit, and it's just like, oh, there's an FHA program out there that allows that has a very low interest rate. Yes, I want to do that. Okay, so what happens is this: they'll say, okay, yeah, I'd like to get a first, you know, the um, the FHA loan. Okay, and the FHA insures it. And listen to what I'm going to tell you: the borrower has to pay MIP. What is MIP? Or if we're just doing what like my student would have done in the class, he thought he was a Weisenheimer. He would he would have said the MIP. <laughs> what is the MIP? What is the MIP? That is okay. That is the mortgage insurance premium. Okay. Mortgage insurance premium. Okay. So Eddie asked, do we have a class on environmental issues? Yeah, if you go into the Prep Agent member dashboard, so if you are not a member, go to prepagent.com, sign up for membership, okay? And in the member uh, in the member section, if you go to webinars and you type in environmental, Cynthia, one of our other instructors, does Yalman's work. She does an amazing job. Chef's kiss. Mwah! for the environmental issues that you guys would have to know for the test. So she does whole webinars on that. Absolutely, it's one of her favorite topics, and she excels at it. So I do, I do suggest that you go there because she is by far um, the, the best one to learn that from. And that's, that's over at prepagent.com in the members section. So if you aren't a member, sign up. So mortgage insurance premium, that is insurance, mortgage insurance that is going to be paid by the borrower. So who is it paid to? Guys, who is it paid to? So the borrower pays it to who? To who do they pay it to? You ever have a song stuck in your head? I have a couple songs stuck in my head. Yeah, Cynthia is amazing. She's an absolutely wonderful instructor. That's why if you haven't seen any of her webinars, um, I really do highly suggest it. Cynthia is... And also, too... What I always tell you guys, if I, if I'm too fast for you, Cynthia goes, much, she goes at a much slower clip. So we, we have that. <laughs> we have a nice dynamic. So like if I'm too much, if I'm a rabid squirrel for you and you want to see some of those um, other, uh, other webinars by other teachers. Also, you know, Joe, too. We all have our own pace, our own teaching style. So that's why we have a lot of different things. So hopefully you stick with me. Hopefully you like being a part of the Stu crew. You like being here so that I could explain these things to you. But I totally get it if I'm not the instructor for you. So that's why we have a whole bunch of different ones. Okay. So, um, FHA, mortgage insurance premium, is going to be paid to the FHA because the FHA, okay, is going to be, you ready? The FHA is going to be um, insuring the lender. So um, the FHA um, is going to be insuring the lender. So in turn, the borrower has to pay the insurance to the FHA. Make sense? Okay. So... Cynthia is fantabulous. Yeah, she is. I love Cynthia. So why don't we round it out? Why don't we talk about um, PMI, okay? Why don't, why don't we talk about PMI, okay? Why don't we talk about PMI? What is that? 
So Brittany said it's like a cycle. It's like, yeah, it's kind of like a circle. You know, it's like the, the FHA insures the lender and then the lender um, and, and then in turn, the borrower insures the uh, pays the insurance, to the FHA. So, yeah, it's a circle. It's a weird little um, circle. PMI is for conventional loans. So, so you ready for this? Let me ask you. Let me ask you because we we just mentioned conventional loans. So, what is a conventional loan? What is that? What is a conventional loan? I want to know what that is because I think that we have to know a little bit about this before before we know what this is. So, PMI is private mortgage insurance, and that would be needed. Okay. That would be needed for conventional loans. Conventional loans are ones that are not going to be, okay, that are not going to be government-backed. So they're not government-backed. So it's not an FHA. It's not a VA loan. Okay, so if you look at a loan, you go, are you VA or are you FHA? And if the loan says to you, no, I'm not, then guess what, okay? then it's typically a conventional loan. So typically, and I'm right, I'm saying this, okay? I'm saying saying typically, okay? Typically, a conventional loan has less risk because typically, generally, it's a lower down it's it, there's going to be more of a down payment. But if if you have a situation where you put less than or your loan to value amount, okay, is going to be greater than 80%, okay? If your loan to value amount is going to be greater than 80%, then you need PMI. Okay, they will per, they will insist that you get private mortgage insurance, okay? Which is basically their the private mortgage insurance is insuring the lender, okay? They're insuring the lender, and then you, in turn, are paying the mortgage insurer, okay? So that is conventional loan, PMI, all that kind of stuff. So let's take a look at the next stuff. So I haven't touched on at all too much any appraisal things, okay? The cost approach. What is the cost approach? What is that? I want to talk a little bit about, about appraisals, Okay. So, yeah, Jack said in regards to conventional loans, okay, in regards to conventional loans, you have a little more skin in the game. Typically, yeah, typically, 100%. So what is the cost approach? Okay, what is the cost approach? So the cost approach, okay, is going to be used for what type of properties? What type of properties are we going to use this approach in as far as appraisals? Okay, so... We're going to be using this for special use buildings, okay? Special use buildings, such as churches, schools, that kind of thing, okay? Churches, schools, um, police stations, okay? All that kind of stuff. So, cost approach is going to be used for buildings like government buildings, churches, schools, yep, all that kind of stuff, libraries, yep, 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 yep. So, what happens is this. In a cost approach... What the appraiser does is they take the value of the improvements. They subtract depreciation. So what are our three depreciation factors? What are our three depreciation factors that we have? Three depreciation factors are going to be economic obsolescence, functional obsolescence, and physical deterioration, right? And we went through a couple of those already today. So the cost approach, what happens is they're going to apply the depreciation factors to the improvements. So listen to what I'm going to say. The improvements are the home, the property, stuff like that, okay? The home, the property, the building, things of that nature, okay? They're going to apply it there, and then they're going to take the land. They're going to use comparables in the land. They're going to use comparables in the land. And then, okay, and then what they're going to do is this, they're going to take the value of the land and add it into the value of the improvements with depreciation factors applied. So we don't depreciate land, okay? We don't depreciate land. 
we depreciate the improvements on the land, but we never depreciate land. Now, listen to what I'm going to tell you. And listen to the English that I'm going to use in this. Land depreciates. The value of land goes up and down. Okay, the value of land goes up and down, right? So, so, so land could appreciate and land could depreciate. Okay, however, when we were appraising the property, we do not double depreciate. We're depreciating the improvements on it, the buildings. Okay, we don't depreciate. Okay, we don't depreciate the um the land. Okay, that's what we mean when we say we don't depreciate. So, let us look at, okay, another one. Let's do this. Let's talk about who is a grantor. Who is the grantor? Who is the grantor? We'll talk about we'll talk about this for a little bit because I think this is super important. Who is a grantor? Got to get used to the O R E E. And Joe's little song. That's kind of like my money dance is Joe's song. The O R E E O R gives the E E receives and the chicka 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 wee wee. I think that's how it goes. Okay. Um, so, so <laughs> it's a, so, so uh, someone said, Malika said, um, this is over 400 people are here. Yeah. I not listen, I can't believe that I have over 400 people listening to me and listening to me make up my, my songs, my dance. Okay. So, what happens is this. The OR gives, the EE receives. So the grantor gives, okay, title, um, or is the giver in a deed. Okay? So that is the situation. The giver in a deed. Okay? So they're going to be the ones who are signing over whatever interest they have. Now, yeah, we have President's Day crowd. We have some people off from schools. So, so... Let's look at the next thing that we're going to do. Ooh, I know. I know. Quit claim deed. Let's go into deed types for a little bit. What's a quit claim deed? Okay. What is a quit claim deed? What is that? I got a whole bunch of things coming in. Ooh, got a whole bunch of things. Okay. Got a whole bunch of stuff. So, let's see. Okay. Let's see. So a quit claim deed, basically what they're saying is this. The grantor, so the differences between deeds, and I think it's important that we um, that we identify the differences in the deeds. Like what, what makes one deed different from another deed, okay? And what makes one deed different from another deed is the promises that the grantor, okay, the promises that the grantor gives to the grantee, okay? So what the grantor is saying is I may or may not own, okay? And I will not defend, okay? So basically what they're saying is whatever interest I have in the property, you now have. So here's the thing. I could give you, I can give you, Stu could give you a quit claim deed to Jay-Z's house, okay? Now... Does that mean that you own Jay-Z's house? Well, no, unless Stu owned Jay-Z's house. You have whatever interest the grantor has at the time that they're giving that to you, okay? Um, so uh, that is the situation with a quitclaim deed. So basically, you are getting whatever interest they have. So if they have absolutely no interest, okay, if they have absolutely no interest, then guess what? The answer to that is going to be you get no interest. You just have a very fancy piece of paper that says you get no interest. You get bubkiss, okay? You have an official, you basically have an official piece of paper that says, here is an official statement that says, I have bubkiss. Um, but if Stu did own Jay-Z's house, you would then own Jay-Z's house. How about that? Okay. And someone said, I can't believe we are still going. This is great, Stu. Yeah, fantastic. I love doing this with you guys. You guys are absolutely wonderful, amazing, amazing folk. I love doing this. So let's see the next one. So I had a couple of you guys ask about this one. So let's talk about reliction. What is reliction? Okay. What is reliction? Love me some water rights because it's something that we don't touch on that much, right? We don't touch on water rights that much. Let's see. What are the what is reliction? What do you guys know about that? So 
Randy asked about a quit claim deed. Um, so when would you use that? So that would be used usually in the transfer of real estate between um, family members. Okay, like if there's a divorce situation, like if I were to get divorced from Mrs. Stu, but she's stuck with me. <laughs> so um, the situation is this: if we were to get divorced, and then we were basically say, "All right, who's getting the home?" Okay, um, you know, basically one of us would sign a quit claim deed over to the other, basically saying, "Here, it's just it's a quick way to get rid of things." Okay, it's a quick way to get rid of things, okay? So what happens is this is a way to create land through the drying up uh, or receding, okay, of water, okay, or the drying up of water, of a body of water, of a body of water. So it creates land that way. So it's either recedes, okay, um, or it dries up. So going back to the quit claim deed, yeah, it's the lowest form of transfer. Yeah, it offers the least amount of protections for the grantee. Okay, it 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 gives it gives the lowest form of protection for the grantee. Makes sense? Okay. Ooh, I love this one. Ready? Someone just put in here. Okay, accretion. What is accretion? So we're going over our bodies of water kind of stuff. Okay. Um, do 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 do. What is accretion? Jackie said, Stu, you are the best. I try to be every once in a while. Um, I know Joe has, you know, he writes in his, his journal every night, goes, I'm so happy I met Stu. Stu's amazing. <laughs> maybe that's puffing. Maybe I'm thinking, maybe I think too much. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm glad that you guys, uh, you guys uh, like this, though. Stu, what is the opposite of rising tides reducing land? Um, so what is the opposite of rising tides reducing land? Probably accretion, <laughs> where you would have the creation of, so I remember this as creation because it looks a little bit like that, okay? So this is a gradual increase of land. This is usually the opposite of erosion, okay? So reliction is a form of accretion, if we were just talking about that in general. It's the increase of land. Um, gradually over time, okay? Um, Paul said for real, though, Joe has a journal. I don't know. <laughs> but if he did, I would love to think that, um, you know, uh, <laughs> that maybe at one point he said, it was awesome in there. Um, so uh, that is the situation there. So accretion is basically the creation of new land. Over time, it's usually the opposite of erosion. That's how I always remember it, okay? So let's go to... I have another one that you guys were asking for, net listing, net listing, okay, net listing. So we'll get away from water for a little bit, okay? Get away from water for a little bit. What is a net listing? Hmm, hmm, hmm. So this is illegal in most, uh, in most states, so just keep that in mind too, okay? Illegal in most states, okay? But net listings are usually uh, are usually going to be situations where you are going to probably be tested on this. Someone just said this is on the Cali test. Yeah, this is definitely going to be on a couple of your tests, okay? Um, because this is illegal in most states. And what it is is the seller says, I want to net $200,000. You, Mr. Real Estate Agent, Mr. Amazing, Fantastic, Wonderful Stew, you... You get to keep anything above that two hundred thousand dollars. So basically, what happens is that is going to be, like I said, illegal in most states. In most states, most scenarios, that would be an illegal situation. So, um, great question, and thank you for actually letting me, uh, you know, putting that in there as far as uh, you know, a question to ask. That was a good one. I like that one. So let's talk about okay, a. Oh, I know what I want to talk about. This is one that I didn't do before. And you guys are putting some great ones in the chat. So thank you for that. What about a periodic estate? Okay. What about a periodic estate? So so someone said in my example before, Brittany said, so if you sell it for you know 250000 and make a $50,000 commission, yeah, you, that's basically what it is. It's basically the seller saying... Um, that's that's the situation in regards to the last question, which was a uh, net listing. Okay, so um, this is a 
This is 1,000% a period to period. So it goes from one period to another period. It basically what it does is the, the key trick here is it auto-renews, okay? It auto-renews into itself. So basically what happens is this. You would get a situation where you would have um, – you know, you would have your situation where um, bottom line is this. You would have a situation in which the period, let's say it's, and it's usually month to month, right, just kind of rolls into itself. It goes from one to another to another to another, okay? So um, that is um, that is the situation there in regards to what a periodic estate is. Ooh, and I see some people writing in some good ones. I like the one that just came in, actually, because I was just talking about this this morning with one of our um, private lesson students. We were talking about specific liens, general liens, all that kind of stuff. So what is a specific lien? What do I mean by a specific lien? So... Let's see. Let's see. Let's take a look. So Ellen said automatic renewal. Yeah, month to month just automatically renews. Renews. Okay. So that is a situation there. Okay. So um, it basically just – so like a month to month, a month to month lease has no end date. If it had an end date, it would be in a state for years, right? So a specific lien, okay, is so when we're talking specific or general, let's talk about the two differences, okay? So specific is for a specific home, okay? When we're talking about specificity in regards to liens, we're talking about a specific property. So listen to me, listen, listen, you have to remember, okay? Because you guys. Hit that like button. You hit subscribe because you guys put in the chat when Joe came on that I that you know you have to give Stu a raise. Bottom line is, let's say this. Let's say Stu got a raise. Okay. Let's say after this webinar, Stu's getting a raise, and I'm going out and I'm buying five properties. So Stu owns five properties. We're gonna say that. Okay. Stu owns five properties. Okay. So I'm money bags. Okay. That's it. I'm done. That's it. I'm going crazy. Now, when I own five properties, okay. The real estate taxes, the mortgages on each one of them would be specific to that. So the lien for the property taxes on property A are specific to that one. The lien for the property taxes for property B are specific to that one. Okay. So the situation is exactly that. I own five properties. A specific lien would go on one of the specific properties, okay? So that is the situation. Now, let's talk a little bit about a general lien. So we're going to talk about the general lien as well. So I'm going to type that in here, okay? A general lien, all right? So what happens is this. And keep in mind, uh, I own five properties. Sandra said, wow, I want to raise like that. Well, you see what happens? It's the power of community. When you guys um, come in here and you just keep typing and you keep saying, Joe, you got to give that stew guy a raise. <laughs> then it works. It works. You guys keep watching. You guys keep going in here, hitting that like button, hit subscribe. That helps me out, helps you out, helps all of us out. So a general lean, okay, is going to be one that's going to be on me in general. So it will go on all five properties, okay? So what happens is this. If I own five properties and you have a general lien, it's going to go on all five of them. Specific is just going to be property A, okay? So general liens are usually IRS income tax liens. Um, what else is going to be there? You're talking income tax liens. Um, what else is going to be one? Uh, oh, a judgment of any sort, right? So if you get sued. So any of you watch the Tiger King, okay? I watched the Tiger King. That was that was a, a an absolute like basically the definition of a dumpster fire. <laughs> so I watched the Tiger King and Carol Baskin sued him, okay? Sued him for everything. It's gonna go on basically all the when she won the judgment, it went it was a general lien and went on everything. It went on all the prop all the personal property and um all of the uh it went on all the personal property and all the real estate. So that is the situation there. So um, specific lien. What if I only have one property? So what happens is this. If you would have specific liens on that property, such as your mortgage, your taxes are all specific. If you were sued, okay, 
you would have the lien go on, okay, uh, go on all of the property that you own, real and personal. That's what a general lien is. A general lien would go on things generally. So that was a great, fantastic, wonderful, beautiful question. Uh, chef's kiss. Absolutely beautiful. Mwah! That was perfect. Thank you for that. Now, let's talk about a um, special warranty deed. Okay. Special warranty deed. Okay. So, special warranty deed. Okay. What is a special warranty deed? So someone asked, how is it specified in regards to the last question of specific lien? It's specified by the property. Specific goes to a specific property, okay? General goes to multiple properties, okay? Would go on multiple properties and potentially personal property. Okay, so like if I own a Lamborghini, okay, it would go on the Lamborghini. I don't own a Lamborghini if you're wondering, okay? If you're wondering, I don't own that. So what is a special warranty deed? Okay, what is that? What is that? Hmm, hmm, hmm. So, let's take a look. Do, 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 do. So, special warranty deed. <laughs> they keep calling you about your car warranty. Oh, my God, I get that all the time. I get I get the phone call. Oh, we're so glad we caught you. We, we wanted to call you about your, your, your uh, the, the warranty on your car. And I said to him, I was like, I was like, burn the car to the ground. I don't need your warranty. <laughs> so special warranty deed is going to be a deed where the grantor says, I own and will defend, okay, against my time owning the property only. Okay. Owning the property. Oh man. Oh my God. My my spelling gets bad when we get to the bitter end. I own it and I will defend it. Um, uh, I will defend it against uh, my time owning the property. So basically, what they say is they're giving you the covenant of season. Okay, they're giving it, giving you the covenant. <coughs> excuse me, of season, which means that the uh, the grantor is saying, "I own it. I sit upon this. This is my property." Okay, um, and I will defend it against my time only. So how I remember it is okay, is this. The special warranty deed, okay? The special warranty deed is like a warranty deed. Now, a warranty deed covers the whole time, beginning of time till the end of time. It's like a warranty deed, but only for my special time with the property, okay? During my special time during the property. So it's a special warranty deed, okay? I own it and will defend it against my time owning the property only. Now, let's talk about this. What is... Okay. Ooh, some gold stars are going out there. Yeah, give yourself a gold star if you stick with me this long. Listen, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That really means a lot to me. What is this one? What is hypothecation? The hip hop, hip hopication. <laughs> what is the hip hypothecation? What is this? What is this? Tell me, guys. And I hope everyone had a great Valentine's Day. Um,. I had a great one. Actually, you know what happened was me and Mrs. Stu. Mrs. Stu had to work Valentine's Day, so she got home late. And um, But listen, all was forgiven because she brought home little Debbie's cakes, okay? Whenever you bring home little Debbie's cakes, <laughs> listen, this is the fastest way to Stu's heart is with food. Rebecca said, I appreciate you, Stu. I appreciate all you guys. You guys really have been fantastic sticking with me this long. So hypothecation. When you mortgage a property or you pledge it as collateral, when you pledge real property as collateral for repayment of a loan, that's hypothecation, okay? That is hypothecation, okay? So um, someone asked, is Mrs. Stu a nurse? No, Mrs. Stu is a Ivy League graduated veterinarian. So basically, as far as the one who brings the smarts in the family, that is Mrs. Stu. Um, Mrs. Stu does have a sense of humor. Um, Mrs. Stu works emergency veterinary medicine. Um, so she works at a level one trauma center. So basically, like she works on celebrities, dogs, and things like that. Like if something were to happen to like Bruce Springsteen's dog, okay, they would bring it to like my wife at her emergency room. Okay, my wife, my wife does Yalman's work. She does amazing, amazing stuff. And she so so what I'm going to tell you is I'm gonna give you like a little test tip, okay? 
you guys got to work on your anxiety. And I, this is kind of like for the um, for, for, for all of you guys who, um, you know, are testing soon and you're stressed out about this. Um, anxiety. <laughs> no, don't define anxiety. Some of you guys are probably sitting there in the chat going, oh, I'm, I'm going to define it. I, I want to tell you this. Um, uh, you know, anxiety is basically this. You want to try to manage it as best as possible. Um, and I also I talk to my wife about that a lot because she you know you know talking about what she does um, we have conversations during the day where you know I, I say right I say how do you I said okay you know she had the other day a dog that got impaled by a deer and it was like basically on its last leg and she said to me she goes um, I, I said to her I said how do you handle that how do you think clearly how do you do that and she said it's simple she goes you cannot make the animal any deader. And I said to her, I said, you know, that was something that hit home with me because I was realized like a lot of my students, you know, stress so much about this and stress so much about what's the worst case scenario? What's the worst case scenario? You fail. Okay. You know, you fail. That's the worst case scenario. And guess what? You can still go to 7-Eleven and get yourself a little Debbie's cake. <laughs> so it's not the end of the world. You come back and listen. We're, we're, you, you come back into the family here. You come back into the family, and we help you out. Um, it, it's something that you're not going to be listen to. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. Everyone who's testing soon, you got this. We're with you. Okay. There's a lot of stuff that you can have that we can help you out with. And if you ever need help or anything like that, uh, shameful plug. Go sign up for a private tutoring session, and what I'll tell you is we'll, we'll we'll talk through that. We'll talk through some of the things that might help you, and it's a it's a way to kind of get yourself through and 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 basically um so basically get to a point where you're feeling maybe a little better about yourself. But we still have some words to do, okay? We still have some words to do. I'm not leaving you hanging. We got more words to do because this is the super bougie webinar. So what is an executed contract? Okay, I've left out some of the contract stuff. Maybe I saved the best for last. What is an what is an executed contract? Okay, Oh no, if someone cried when they didn't pass. No, don't cry when you don't pass. Go you that means you need listen. If you're crying after you didn't pass, okay? Just you have to give yourself an extra little Debbie's cake. The the the, the black ones, the zebra cakes, those are the best ones, okay? And that's actually a fact, just so you know. Execute a contract means it's done. Donezo. They sometimes refer to this as a discharged contract, right? So if it's discharged, that means it's donezo, okay? Um, nothing left to be completed, okay? Executed, done, discharged, okay? Finished, completed, kaputskis, okay? So what is – so someone said avulsion. So let's type that in there. Why not? Let's type that in there, okay? No, Lacey said I failed by one point, and then I, I cried in the bathroom at the testing center. No, get out of the testing center. Get yourself a little Debbie's cakes. You need food. You need you need comfort food. Food comforts everything. I don't know what's, I don't know why, but food solves a lot of stuff. Okay, so that's what I'll tell you. Avulsion. What is that? That's a sudden loss of land. So basically, think of this. Okay, basically, if you watch a video. Think of it this way. You ever watch a time-lapse video and you're watching things? Like erosion, you would watch on a time-lapse video and you'd be like, oh, my God, it's it's a year and a half. And look, like five feet of the um, of the property went away. So what, what I was going to say is this. Avulsion? Avulsion is Macaulay Culkin, Home Alone, slap, the, slap your face and be like, oh. <laughs> Basically, think of landslides. Think of... Um, like really like type in avulsion into YouTube. Guess what? When you're done here, when you're done here, don't leave me yet. If you leave me now, you're going to take away the biggest part of me. Okay. What I'm going to tell you is this stick with me, but avulsion, basically you type that in there. You'll, you'll understand it really quickly. It's, it, 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 it's basically like the OMG. It is the sudden violent tearing away of land. Okay. Um, that is the situation there. So, um, that is the situation. So someone said, uh, "I'll buy the the, the zebra, zebra Debbie cake the day before my exam to cheer me up." It's, I mean, they're delicious. I've listen all my life. I've never had a problem, uh, you know, with 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 fixing things with food. Well, that's also why I am not, you know, I don't have a six pack and things like that. But six packs is six packs are <sighs> overrated. <laughs> 
Let's look at the next question. I got one for you. Life estate. Boom. I'm sharing. I'm saving some of the best for, 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 for last. Okay. So what is a life estate? What is a life estate, guys? Okay. So what is a life estate? What is this? Debbie said I love these long sessions. And guys, here's the thing. We're trying these out. So you guys got to hit that like button. You got to hit subscribe. You got to stick with me the whole entire time. You got to sit here and watch this afterwards, okay? So that's that. That's how we're going to keep doing this, okay? We're basically going to keep doing these sessions like this, okay? When you guys see that you guys, uh, that you guys like it. So if you guys like these, there's more to come. There's more stew. We're going to do these longer sessions. So this is ownership. That is based on the life of someone or something. So it could be based on the life of someone else or on the life estate holder. Now, if I just said you have a life estate, right? If I said, okay, um, if I said that I'm giving a life estate to Mrs. Stu, that means that I'm giving a life estate for as long as Mrs. Stu lives, okay? For as long as Mrs. Stu lives. Now, if I said... I'm going to give Mrs. Stu a life estate for as long as my brother lives. Then it will be based on my brother's life, okay? So let me ask this question. Can you sell or lease the property if you have a life estate? Can you sell or lease a life estate? Can you sell or lease a life estate? Uh, yes, 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 you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Because, listen, it's ownership. It is ownership, okay? So I'm going to end on this one. This is going to be our last one. You ready? Freehold estates, all right? Because we're getting to that time. We're getting to the time where, okay, for where it's time to say adieu, say a stew, I will see you soon, okay? It's not going to be too long, but I'm going to see you real soon. But let's talk about freehold estates. Freehold estates, okay? <laughs> I can't end it. I know. I know. It's so sad. It's so sad. But I need to go ahead and get like a burger or something or like a cheesesteak. I'm, I'm like dying for one of those, okay? Um, so a freehold estate, this is ownership, guys. And this is why we were having trouble with the question, Okay. Is a can you can you sell or lease a property with a life estate? When you, when you do sell or lease a life estate, you are selling or leasing property that is going to that that ownership is going to end. Okay, that that ownership is going to end on the death of whoever it's based on. So you get the full bundle of rights. Okay, that's it. That's a freehold estate. So that is um, so. Um, someone said, your clock is too fast, dude. I think we have two more hours. No, my belly. Do Listen, my clock is not fast because you know why my clock goes by my belly. And I think that I need cheesesteak in my belly. So, um, what I'm going to tell you is this, guys. Um, thank you so much for sticking with me. What I want you to do is I want you to make sure, uh, give me a big old smile in the chat. I want to see everyone who's been here, who got something out of this. I hope that you did. Um, remember if you are not a prep agent member, okay, if you're not a prep agent member, what I want you to do is go to prepagent.com, sign up today. And also if you need more stew in your life, okay, or you need some help from Cynthia, what I want you to do is this. I want you to go over over to the private tutoring section. Remember, sign up for a private tutoring session. S sign up earlier rather than later because we book up very quickly. Guys, this has been an amazing, wonderful President's Day. Thank you so much for sticking with me. Thank you so much for coming today. Have a great one. We're going to see you real soon.